Well, you can't say CPS didn't get behind the show early. Last episode had special guest star Patrick Duffy, and now we're already getting a visit from good old John Ross Ewing Jr., Larry Hagman. I'm sure he just wants to wish Gary and Valine well and not cause any problems. Oh, by the way, right around this time on Dallas, JR is trying to have Gary and Valine's daughter Lucy married off and shipped to Chicago so that none of them will ever bother him again. Val is still really into beach life, chatting with the Fairgate's son, Eric, about learning how to swim. They spot an oil vessel off the coast, and oil can mean only one thing. J.R. Ewing, with appropriate Dallas theme music, wheels and deals in his Dallas office. In this case, it's to quash any objection to offshore drilling off the coast of the Knott's Landing development. As far as I know, nobody even knows we're drilling in Knott's Landing. Good, let's keep it that way. It's like JR just has to ruin everything Bobby touches. Gary is worried that everyone will think he's involved in the drilling. Indeed, Richard Avery immediately speculates that Gary's arrival and the offshore drilling are connected. Karen sends out the Karen signal to rally the community against the project, but Gary is reluctant to get involved. In a really cute moment, Val lets Gary talk himself into attending the meeting anyway. Under the, well, I'm glad that's not a problem anymore umbrella, Sid notes that people are more likely to favor cheaper gas over the environment. Yeah, no way that's going to come back to bite us in real life. And if it does, I'm sure we'll do a quick course correction. It'll be fine. Anywho, the offshore drilling is being conducted by a company called Petrolux, of which Ewing Oil is a shareholder. Petrolux communications flack Chip Todson shows up to the meeting, and it's clear he has a past with Laura Avery. Her husband Richard seems more concerned with Chip's sweet ride, though. Diversity check. There are more black characters in this meeting than there are in the first three seasons of Dallas. Although Chip Todson is the world's widest sounding name, so I'd imagine some diversity was required just by the laws of physics. Otherwise, the existence of a Chip Todson might form a Caucasian wormhole and cause the universe to collapse in on itself. Chip tries to quell Karen's neighborhood watch brigade, but he is the least equipped spokesperson ever, having literally no answers for anything. Now, what are you gonna do about it? Well, I'm not an engineer. It gets worse when Gary asks a simple, pointed question. Why not landing and not a more remote land-based site? Valid question, sir. Unfortunately, I don't have the facts. Oh, I could give you an answer, but the only ones who'd understand it would be you and me. And that includes your teacher. <laughs> Chip gets rattled when he finds out he's talking to Gary Ewing. He does the right thing and promises to get answers so he can get the hell off the stage before causing any more damage to the project's reputation. He also offers to meet up with Laura for lunch. Chip reports back to JR about Gary speaking up in the meeting. JR fumes and promises to come there personally to straighten things out. Karen organizes a rally against Petrolex, which Gary refuses to get involved in. After all, he's trying to get away from the Ewing oil drama. Val explains as much to Karen, but Karen thinks actual revenge is a better form of revenge than living well. JR pulls in to interrupt them, leaving Val flabbergasted. JR's greeting of Val as his favorite sister-in-law is all the more hilarious because it's actually probably true by default. Certainly man enough for me and Sue Ellen to produce a son and heir. Something which you and Bobby seem incapable of. Sue Ellen and Cliff. The other great thing about this scene is that Karen immediately declares herself as JR's enemy, which just excites JR. In one of the more chilling scenes of the episode, Val tries to run interference for Gary by promising they don't mean to interfere in JR's business and they have no intention to return to Dallas. And JR just calmly repeats a request for her to call up Gary. And each time it's calmer, but somehow more malevolent because of Val's pleading. It seems like this where JR spills over from charming anti-hero to frightening sociopath. Val finally relents and calls Gary to come home. Laura and Karen make protest banners and engage in the hot goss about the Ewings, with Karen admitting that JR isn't bad looking and pondering why Lucy doesn't live with her parents. In a telling line, she says Val and Gary's marriage is everybody as solid as the Fairgates, or the Averys. Almost on cue, Laura receives a call from Todd and hangs up on him. Karen is immediately suspicious, but gets distracted by Gary returning home. Richard returns home and pouts that he's not appreciated at work. It's hard not to get an immediate Cliff Barnes vibe from this guy. True to form, he practically asks his wife to prostitute herself to Chip Todson so that he can have an in on the Petrolux account. Please, don't make me. What's the matter with you? Wait, wait, we can still do this because you still have access to the files. 
Oh, Claire. JR admonishes Gary for jeopardizing their mother's financial future with his silly questions about the project. Gary says he's not even going to bother with the protest because he doesn't think he'll get the answers he wants anyway. But Val rightly notes that JR wouldn't even be here if he didn't think they could do some damage. And besides, JR's powers lessen the longer he's away from Dallas. JR threatens to break Gary all over again if he stands up for himself and his community. I'll break you. Again. That night, the Ewings and the Fairgates have coffee together and hatch a plan. Karen will use her feminine wiles to lure JR out of the Petrolux offices, and Gary will steal relevant files about the alternate drilling locations. We get vastly different dual Matahari situations as Laura shows up at Chip's apartment in the obviously painted backdrop district, and Karen surprises JR. Hi. Karen's ruse is revealed when Gary calls her at JR's apartment, but she's not scared. In fact, she was in control the whole time. Laura, on the other hand, has a really creepy encounter with Chip, who says the non-consensuality of the whole thing turns him on. We're going to have to have a bigger conversation on how Laura is treated in the first handful of episodes. JR threatens to tell Lucy that Val and Gary are remarried if anything from the stolen files is used against him. Richard gets Laura to distract Chip while he schmoozes with JR, but Chip gets way too creepy with Laura and causes a scene. Is it yours, Laura? Yes. And Richard's? Or aren't you sure? Give you a call? <laughs> hey! Richard tells Laura he never wanted her to do something that made her uncomfortable. Oh yeah, where would she get that idea? Please, don't make me. What's the matter with you? Gary and Val call JR's bluff and dare him to hurt Lucy because if he does, Jock and Ellie will come down on him like the hammer of Thor. The thunder of my vengeance will echo through these corridors like the gust of a thousand winds. Gary reveals that he knows Petrolux has found alternate, safer sites and that they were ignored because they would be more expensive. JR tries to threaten his way out of it, but Gary stands up to him for once. JR has no choice but to back down and tell the residents that they will go ahead with a more expensive slant drilling operation. There's an alternate drilling site on shore. We are going to accept that loss and drill on shore. Of course, JR turns lemons into lemonade by mining the environmentalist angle for publicity. But not before he stops to tell Gary he's proud of him for stooping low enough to beat him. Well, I gotta hand it to you, Gary. Starting to act like real Ewing. Proud of you. The Fairgates, Ewings, and Averys all celebrate a job well done. And we're out. This felt very Marvel Comics crossover with JR coming in to wreak havoc and being written as slightly off his usual characterization because of the different writing staff. That's not a knock, just an observation. In fact, it was a good way of separating the two shows. On Dallas, JR would never let someone get one over on him so easily. But this isn't JR's show. A similar thing happens in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spin-off Angel, which struggled to find its voice early on with multiple cameos by the original series cast propping it up until late into the first season, where Angel the character essentially declares his independence from Buffy, and the series draws a narrative line in the sand. You don't know me anymore, so don't come down here with your great new life and expect me to do things your way. Go home. So if you were hoping for JR to come in and wreak havoc in the cul-de-sac, you're going to have to wait until season two. This episode is purely about pulling one over on old JR so that Gary and Val don't seem like also rams on their own show. Plus, it's great to see Karen hopping into the Scooby gang to hit JR where it hurts. One thing I do think hurts this show in the early years is that it's treated like the spinoff that lives downhill from the real show. And by that, I mean the writers don't want to take the chance on confusing the Dallas audience, but they do want the Dallas audience to mosey on over to watch Knott's Landing. As a result, things on Dallas, such as JR getting shot, Jock dying, and Bobby getting run over, do spill over into Knott's Landing, but the story doesn't run uphill. After episode 6, Lucy is mostly unaffected by Gary and Val reconciling. As far as I know, no one from Knott's Landing appears on Dallas, save for Gary popping up once in a while, and there's a wedding or a will to read. The finale is an alternate reality thing, so it's hard to count that. But it's probably too much to expect both series to be on equal footing because Dallas was about to launch into an ungodly position in the cultural landscape, one whose ripple effects are still felt to this day. As for the episode itself, it's a breezy caper with a well-established villain who reveals the foibles of the protagonist. Val is intensely protective of Gary and his emotional well-being. Gary is struggling with his self-esteem, but he's getting there. Richard quickly settles into the cliff barns of the show, somehow being a manipulative user while presenting as just clueless enough to escape moral consequences. Most of all, Karen is ready to jump in for the cause, something that will define her character early in the show as Michelle Lee becomes the standout player. 
We'll see how Richard and Karen's opposing viewpoints come to a head in the next episode. 